The scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babber wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of Areopagus said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and, and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius and Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Great, uh, good to see you all. And uh, for all the parents whose children are crying, don't worry, it's just good to hear voices again. So uh, just be, 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 it's great to, great to have children with us again. Uh, and also good to hear people singing. So uh, I don't know if about you, but uh, uh, the only voice I could hear when I was singing was my own, and it's not very inspiring, but uh, good to hear voices again. <clears throat> um, we're in a series in Acts, and uh, the series we've called is, uh, we've called the series The Future is Past Comprehension, uh, which simply means we want to listen to the early days of the early church to try and understand what the future uh, days of the present church might be. And uh, if you think about being a Christian in India today, it's a lot like being uh, a fan of the Pakistani cr uh, cricket team. Like you, you, you love something you're not supposed to love, and you could get into trouble for it and you're a minority. Very few people in India support the Pakistani Christian, uh, cricket team, Christian team. But, uh, uh, but the question I wanna ask is how, how did these, this early church, this minority, this small group of people who loved Jesus make such a big noise, make such a big difference? Because here we are, we're, we're what, 45 people in a room on a Sunday? How does a small group of people make a difference in a city of 25 million? How do you do that? And, and I want to point to three things we'll see in the passage. Uh, we're going to see, we need, we, if you're going to be a church that makes that kind of difference, uh, 
we need distressed hearts uh, we need renewed minds and we need clear voices we need distressed hearts renewed minds and clear voices uh, i know although the whole passage was read to you i'm just going to focus mostly on verse 16 17 and 18. so in verse 16 we see paul uh, it says in verse uh, chapter 17 verse 16 now while paul was waiting for them at athens his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Another translation says he was distressed. He was distressed. If you know what distressed genes are, then you know what a distressed heart is. It's, it's worn down, it's, it's provoked. It's, it's stressed, it, it, it's, it's a sleepless night. That's what a distressed heart is. And the reason that Paul is distressed is because he sees that the city is full of idols. And the thing with idols is that idols are not just physical things. The physical idol is simply a manifestation of an inward desire. The idol represents something that you long for, that you want. And that's what drives human beings. This is what we need to know about human beings. Human beings are driven by desire. And what the, the, the reason idols are distressing is because the desire that controls your heart controls your life. The desire that controls your heart controls your life. Most human beings think that the problem with me is the lack of information. If I just get more information, I'll sort it out. No, human beings were created to love and to desire and to enjoy God more than anything else, above all things. That's, that's what we were made for. But what's gone wrong with human beings is our desires have gone astray. So we have gone astray. That's the fundamental problem with human beings. And you'll never understand why people do what they do until you understand what God made us to do. He made us desiring creatures. We're creatures of desire whose desires have gone astray. This is the fundamental problem with human beings. We're creatures of desire whose desires have gone astray. And what desire controls your heart controls your life. So idols are fundamentally substitutes. They're God substitutes. We were created to find joy and delight in God, but now we're looking elsewhere. We're looking to other things that will give us this joy and this delight for which we were made, but for which we're looking elsewhere. And that's distressing. That's the distressing thing about idols. And I, I, when, when a desire can have a, a, a different kinds of effects in different kinds of people. A desire can make you a person who pursues something. So you're driven towards something. So you have a pursuit. The desire makes you uh, a hunter. But a desire can also be turned backward. So, it, it, so a desire is something I want, but when a desire is turned backward, it's something I don't want. And that can give you, put you in a life of retreat. You're just trying to be safe. You don't want to take risks. So either a desire can go astray because it, it makes you pursue something that you think will, delight, it will, will bring you delight, or you retreat because you think there's danger. But the desire that controls your heart controls your life. And there's two reasons why uh, idols are distressing. Idols are distressing because they won't let us tell the truth and they won't let us hear the truth. They won't let us tell the truth and they won't let us hear the truth. There's this 1993 movie called Damini. It's a Bollywood classic. And it uh, treated the subject of rape with a kind of sensitivity that Bollywood has never done. It's a story of a girl named Damini who gets married to uh, uh, this rich young man and lives with his family in a luxurious bungalow. And one day she witnesses the, her husband's younger brother uh, and, his, and his friends raping the housemaid. And she's distressed. So she, she tells her husband and uh, they try to bring this to light. They try to bring this to justice. And the whole movie is how this single woman, this, this woman is singled out and, and, and her character is assaulted. She's called mentally unstable because the family honor is at stake. The family honor is at stake. 
See, when family honor becomes the desire that controls your heart, you can't tell the truth. You can't tell the truth. You can't face the truth. Because family honor is at stake. Because family honor has been idolized. It's been idolized. What will people think? And idolatry and war is, is very similar. The first casualty is truth. And when family honor is of utmost importance, it won't let you tell the truth. So if there's abuse in the family, if there's uh, adultery in the family, if there's all these dirty things that we don't want anyone to know, we'll cover up the truth and we'll silence the people who tell the truth. Because family honor is at stake. And that's why idols are distressing. And idols are distressing because they won't let us hear the truth. And everyone's really distressed about this Veer Das uh, comedian's video who's, that's gone viral. Because he's telling the truth and nobody wants to hear it. Because na national pride is at stake. National identity is at stake. And when national identity becomes an idol, you can't hear the truth. You can't listen to the truth. You'll have to silence the guy. You have to, you have to punish the guy, you attack him. Now, whatever, whatever you may think about Virda, I don't want to defend him or accuse him, but whatever you may think of him, at least he's distressed. At least he's distressed about what he's seeing. And that's what Paul is experiencing. He's walking through this city full of idols and he's distressed. You know, one of the things that a church's health must be marked by is whether we feel the same way. Are we distressed when we see a nation, a city full of idolatry? When we see a people who we can't understand, why do they do what they do? And you won't understand why people do what they do until you know, understand the heart of idolatry. Idols won't let you tell the truth You'll always, you'll always spin the truth or Photoshop the truth or filter the truth or color the truth, manipulate the truth, toy with the truth. You'll never lie. See, Christians, Christians, we never lie. We, 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 we know lying is bad, but we play with the truth. We toy with the truth. We tell the truth that people can bear to hear or that we can bear to tell, but not the whole truth. And I, the, the reason I'm saying this to us is because <clears throat> To, to serve a city of idols and, and, and to be distressed about a city of idols, we also first need to be distressed about the idols in our own hearts. See, only someone who's distressed about the idols in our own hearts can effectively serve a city full of idols. Otherwise, it's like a doctor who's got COVID who goes into a ward full of senior citizens with comorbidities trying to serve them. You become a danger to them. Because you're not aware of what's inside you that's killing you. The only, only people who are distressed about their own idolatry can effectively serve a city of idols. And, I, and, and for, for a church, for a small church, even for a small church like ours, I want to I remind us that the word disciple does not mean teacher. The word disciple means learner. Someone who's always learning. You know, and I, I love how this, uh, I think it was Dane Ortland or Ray Ortland, one of the Ortland uh, family said that we should never try to advance beyond the gospel. We should never try to advance beyond the gospel. Sometimes Christians think of the gospel as the entry gate to the Christian life and then what's next? And the, the gospel is the entire Christian life and the gospel is always always wanting to expose the idolatry in our heart and heal it. So just like, I, I don't know if there's someone in your family who, who you find difficult to convince to go to the doctor when they're ill. I don't know if you know anyone in your family like that. You keep telling them so something's wrong. No, 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 everything's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Nothing's wrong. But everyone can see something's wrong. You know how frustrating it is to get people to go to the doctor? But that's what some of us are like in, in, in the church. We, we, we don't want to look at our idols. We don't want to look at what's in our heart. But if you're going to serve a city of idols, we need to be distressed not only about the idols in the, in the city, we need to be distressed about our own idols. 
So we have to ask, you know, what, what, what do you want so much that it keeps you from telling the truth, the whole truth? And what do you, what do you fear so much that it keeps you from listening to the truth? Even from yourself, because when you want something, we'll even lie to ourselves to get it. We won't even want to hear the truth from within our own hearts. We'll suppress it. That's what our desire has control of us. And when, and when, when, some, when, when we fear something, it makes it difficult to hear the truth, even from ourselves. Even from ourselves. So we, we need this, this sense of distress when we see idols and recognize that our, our, the, the fundamental human, for the fundamental problem with human beings is that we were created to be worshippers where our desires and our hearts delight in God, but we have become idolaters. You will never understand human behavior until you accept this. You'll never understand human behavior until you accept this. We were created for all our desires to be aligned to God, to, to find our deepest delight in Him, but we have become idolaters looking elsewhere. And it needs to be something that distresses us, not just for the city, but for ourselves. But the second thing we, we, we need we, is, is we need renewed minds. In verse 17 it says, so, he, so Paul, he, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. See, if we live in a city of idols, a city of idols needs a church of worshippers. A city of idols needs a church of worshippers. It needs to be able to see a church of worshippers. It needs that. And there's nothing like true worshippers to expose the falsehood of idolatry. Now, the thing about Paul is that Paul was once, Paul is distressed about idolatry now, but, you know, he wasn't always distressed about idolatry. Right? And the thing, that, the, the, the thing that he was really distressed about, let's put it down another way, the thing that he was really distressed about was the report that Jesus has risen from the dead. That's the thing that distressed his heart earlier. So something has happened to his thinking where the thing that used to distress him is the thing that he is now preaching, is the thing that he's now declaring. So in his mind, no crucified man can be Israel's Messiah. It's not possible. No king of Israel will wear a crown of thorns. That's ridiculous. No king of glory will be found at the bottom uh, at, 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 a, at a crucifixion where slaves go to die. That can't be Israel's Messiah. He's distressed about it. And you, and you know from our, from our study in Acts that he was a persecutor, a blasphemer, and a violent man. But now he's preaching that Christ is risen from the dead. He's changed his mind. And I want you to know, it's a traumatic thing to change your mind. Nobody wants to change their mind. It's not natural. People don't believe what they don't want to believe. It's called cognitive dissonance. We, we choose the books that confirm what we already believe. We choose the people to trust that confirm what we already believe. People don't want to believe what they don't want to believe. People don't believe what they don't want to believe because the desire that controls your heart controls your life. It controls your thinking. We don't want to believe that our child is, uh, is, is, is being uh, 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 spoilt. We don't want to believe that we love our jobs more than we love our wives or our husbands. We don't want to believe that there's idolatry in us. We don't want to believe these things. Nobody, nobody wants to change their mind, but every Christian, every true Christian, every earnest Christian has been through this traumatic change of mind. There's, because you, recog you recognize that before I came to Christ, I lived as, if, as I, I lived as if God was either asleep or dead. But now I, you, you reckon with the fact that Christ is risen, 
and it changes your mind. You go through a baptism of desire. You don't want the same things you did earlier. You want new things, you want different things, you know, you won't settle for the life that was offered before. You want a new thing because now you recognize that Jesus is alive. And the thing about, about what happens is that Paul is reasoning in the synagogue and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So if, 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 if you think of a city of idols and it needs a church of worshippers, one thing we need to recognize is that Christian life is everyday life. He's in the synagogues on a Sunday, which is a synagogue. the synagogue is the precursor to the church. The synagogue is there uh, on a Sunday or, or the first day of the week or the Sabbath. But the rest of the week, he's in the marketplace. Every Christian life is everyday life. Because the church is not a place of worship. The church is a people of worship. So we're, we're worshipping whether we're here on a Sunday, we're worshipping on a Monday at work, we're worshipping uh, on a Thursday when we're uh, playing with the kids in the garden, we're worshipping wherever we are, we just worship in different ways. Christian life is everyday life and that's why a city of idols needs to see a community of worshippers every day. So, so what is this worship? I want to point to two things that worship is. Worship is first of all uh, a reordering of our desires. It's a reordering of our desires. Because if you think of idolatry, when, when our desires are strong, then our thinking is weak. When our desires are strong, our thinking is weak. And here you have these two groups of people, the Epicureans uh, and the Stoics who are debating with Paul. And it, it's, a, it's an oversimplification, but Epicureans want, uh, Epicureans believed uh, that the gods were largely indifferent to us and you basically have to choose pleasure, choose what is, choose what gives you joy. So we live in submission to our desires. We live in submission to what is good for us. So minimum, minimum pain, maximum pleasure. That's the Epicurean mantra, minimum pain, maximum pleasure. And it can lead, and, and, and the thing about uh, the Greek, Greek philosophy is that we are more discipled by Greek philosophy than we realize. So because Greek philosophy shaped Western civilization, Western civilization gave us the university, university came here, we went to university, guess what, we, that was, guess what we're indoctrinated with? Greek philosophy. And Greek philosophy and Christian thinking, they don't go together. Here's Epicureans uh, basically thinking, we want a life of minimum pain, maximum pleasure and what it leads to when epicurean philosophy guides your christian thinking you will want a savior who's practical you'll want a savior who's practical who provides you with minimum pain and maximum pleasure and if the pain gets too high you'll wonder what kind of a savior is this because we're epicurean in our thinking and the stoics the stoics are the kinds who live for obligation and duty so they live for, uh, their, their mantra is minimum shame, maximum honor. Minimum shame, maximum honor. And it can lead to people who desire a powerful leader who will bring them much glory and honor. Does any of this sound familiar? In a city of idols, where one mantra is minimum pain, maximum pleasure, another mantra is minimum shame, maximum honor. But worship is a, it's a reordering of our desires. God is changing our desires because he, he knows what, what the desire that controls your heart controls your life. So, we, so he's working to reorder our desires. And in Matthew 22, 37 to 38, Jesus says, when he's asked a question, what is the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Now, uh, so Augustine, summarizes the Christian life in one sentence. He said, it is, the Christian life is to love God and do as you please. To love God and do as you please. Because at the heart of it, we know if you love someone, if you really love someone, what will you do for them? You'll do anything. You'll do anything. Because when you love someone, your desires will wrap themselves around 
their joy. Love God, do what you want. That's the Christian life. And I want you to know, idolatry means that we give this devotion, this devotion to either a person or a thing. And I want you to know, no human being is worthy of this kind of devotion. And no created thing is worthy of this kind of devotion. And our, our hearts are driven by this. We're driven by uh, people, driven towards people or things. And we make idols out of people or things. And the devotion that belongs to God is given to people or things. And it's, it's for a human being to be given that kind of burden, it's unbearable for them. It's unloving to them. To, to expect that from them. It's unbearable. It's not, a, it's not a weight a human being can bear. Only God can bear that weight. And for to give that thing to a, to a created thing, it's unrealistic. No created thing can bear that expectation. And, and so, so, so you get another picture in Psalm 37 verse 4 where scripture says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, Oprah's view of this is that whatever you want, the Lord will give. And for her, Lord is love, compassion, goodness, kindness. It's not. A, it's it's just a vague, anything, any one size fits all, catch all term for all things that she considers good. Now, what this means is that the more you delight in God, the more you your your study of Scripture is not driven by what can you do for me, but who are you. What kind of a person are you? What do you love? What do you hate? And, and, and your, your heart's desire is wrapped up around this idea, love, love, to love you and to do as you please. The more you delight in God, the more you will love what he loves and hate, hate what he hates. That's why Jesus says in John 15, 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in me, if, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But there's a big if, right? If, if, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And you, you know this in relationship, right? Couples that live together become more and more like each other. Right? And, and this, is, this is the reality in, in our relationship with God, that as we, bec as we delight in him, it shapes our desires. It reorders our desires. There's things that we once found important, we don't find important anymore. There's things that we want, once found life-giving, we don't find them life-giving anymore. There's things that we found unimportant, but now we find them crucially important. We can't live without it. Things change. And it's, it's like in, in C.S. Lewis's uh, Prince Caspian, when Lucy meets Aslan, the lion, she says to him, Aslan, you've gotten bigger. And Aslan says, no, I haven't gotten bigger. You've just grown older. Because the more you grow, the bigger I get. The more you delight in God, the bigger he gets in your heart, the more precious he becomes. And the more your desires conform to what will make him the object of your pleasure. So worship is a reordering of our desires, but worship is also a restructuring of our relationships. So if, if when desires are strong and, and thinking is weak and worship is a reordering of our desires, when people are difficult, thinking is difficult. So when people are difficult, thinking is difficult. So you, you see what, what happens here in, in verse uh, 17. Uh, he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. Verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. And here's what they said. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? What is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. Now, if you think about, uh, if you think about this, if you think about what this means for us, you know, the word babbler it points to a bird who's trying to find food in, a, in garbage. So it's living off scraps. And there's a, the, 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 the people who are saying this might in Delhi represent the, the intellectual left. 
who when they think of when they hear Christianity, when they think of Christianity, they think of us as babblers who have scraps of knowledge and fundamentally are saying, you don't know what you're talking about. What is this babbler trying to say? What is this babbler trying to say? I have scraps of knowledge, you don't know what you're talking about. Now the other, the other criticism is from another group of people who say he's advocating foreign gods. Now this might be your uh, religious right, who basically think that we are uh, perpetuating imperialist, colonialist uh, fairy tales, and we're betraying, we're betraying our national identity. You're advocating foreign gods. Now these words won't, won't seem too hurtful just as words, but when these words come from people we love, people who belong to our family maybe, people who are close friends, you don't know what you're talking about. You're behaving like a babbler. You're advocating foreign gods. This is not who we are. You know, that, that, those, that, that'll sting. And, and when that happens, you, know, you, you, you need a restructuring of relationships because uh, the, the, what this means for us is, is that uh, our, our chief witness to the world, right? our chief witness to the world has nothing to do with the world. It has everything to do with how we love one another. Because Jesus' command in John 13, 34 is a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Then the world will know that you are my disciples. So in some ways, this project is easy. All we have to do is love the 50 people in this room. That's it. Sim the simplest and the hardest thing to do. It's easy to love people far away. It's very difficult to love the neighbor next to you. But at this, if this happens, if this happens, if we've become a family, right, then we're able to sustain the criticism from anyone who calls us babblers or those who call us advocating foreign gods. Because we have in this family, our true family. And sometimes, you know, the value of family is, is the value of the church as a family is felt most when we feel rejection from our own families. That's when the value of this family deepens because we're hearing those words from those people and we need voices to encourage us daily. That's why scripture says, encourage one another daily. We need a restructuring of our relationships. And perhaps, you know, perhaps when we see ourselves as a real family, maybe the world will see us as real worshipers. Because this is a very unlikely family. If you look around the room, you will see so much diversity. You may even say, if I was in my right mind, I may not choose these people to be my friends, but God has chosen us to be family. And maybe when we see ourselves as real family, we'll be seen by the world as real worshipers. So our, our chief witness to the world has little to do with the world. It's how we love one another. So worship is a reordering of our desires. It's a restructuring of our relationships. But the big question we need to ask is, what is the reason for worship? What is the reason? Why, why does God deserve this kind of devotion? And why not something else? And in verse 17, we hear Paul's clear voice. Why, why, why are they calling him a babbler? Why are, they why are they saying that he's advocating foreign gods? Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. See, the resurrection gives us a new normal. It gives us a new normal. I... I went to uh, visit a friend in Bangalore two weeks ago, uh, whose father suddenly died. And when my mother died in, in March, uh, his father and he came over to Delhi to visit and be with us. Uh, because his father and my father have been friends since fourth standard, uh, went to school together, went to college together, went to uh, uh, work together in some way. And uh, so they came here. So when his father suddenly died, we went, we went to be with him. 
and he's uh, sitting next to me and he uh, uh, so he he we were, we we're having a short conversation and then he knows of course my, my mother passed away and then he asked me how long does it take before it starts to feel normal again how long does it take before it starts to feel normal again and i kind of instinctively told him normal is gone normal is gone there's no there's no going back because once grief gets inside you it doesn't go away sometimes it swells up sometimes it shrinks down but it never goes normal normal is gone saint jesus has felt the distress of the power of death he's felt this when when lazarus dies and jesus goes to uh, meet the family he, he knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knows that. But he's with the family and he, shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Because he's distressed. Because this is not normal. This is not the normal that Jesus wanted. People dying. This is not the normal that he wanted. And the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that the resurrection gives us a new normal. It gives us a new normal. Because what, what is useful about the resurrection? What is good news about the resurrection? What did it do exactly? See, it rescues us from slavery. That's what it does. It rescues us from slavery. If you think about, let me ask you a trick question, Bible quiz. How do the Ten Commandments start? Do they start with, you shall have no other gods before me? No, the Ten Commandments start with something that is said before the Ten Commandments. Scripture says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then it says, you shall have no other gods before me. The God's, God's power precedes God's commands, God's grace precedes God's law. God's love goes before God's demands. God's rescue comes before God's commands. We obey him not because he has commanded us. We obey him because he has rescued us. And he's done what we can't do for ourselves. We can't do for ourselves. There are, there are companies in Silicon Valley trying to cure death. We can't do it. And we, this year, you know, we, we've all been touched by death one way or another. Either you lost someone you loved or nearly lost someone you loved. We've all been touched by death one way or another this year. And the thing about the power of death is that once it touches you, it changes things. And it changes things, it changes your priorities. Sometimes you might go to a funeral and it might make you conscious of the significance of life and you might change a few things in your life. It might reorder your priorities one way or another. But eventually they kind of revert to their original shape. You know, death, the power of death, when it touches you, it can change you. But the thing is, when the power of the resurrection touches you, it changes you more. It changes you more. It reorders your desires and, and your fears. And the deeper you're touched by the power of the resurrection, your desires will refuse to go back to their original shape because you know what that life was like. You know, I, I don't want that life anymore. I don't, I don't want that old way anymore because I know what it was like. Because once you've had a taste of the power of the resurrection, you can't go back to that old way. It changes you more. And that's why in scripture, in Hebrews 2, 14, 15, it says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil, 
and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. See, Israel's story is our story. Their idolatry is our idolatry. Their slavery is our slavery, but our rescue is greater than their rescue. Our salvation is greater than our salvation, than their salvation. We find when, you, when, when you're free from the fear of death, then you have the power to live. When you're free from the power, free of fear of death, that's when you have the power to live. That's when you have the power to, that's when you find freedom from idolatry and you can tell the truth without fearing rejection. And you can hear the truth without fearing, without fearing shame. Your desires will conform to his desires. Your, your heart will be drawn to see his people as your people. All of that will change because, not because he has commanded you, but because he has rescued you. You know, I, you, my, my whole life, I always wanted to be the voice of reason. In a, in a, whether it's at a team meeting or something, I always wanted to be the voice of reason, the sensible one, the truth teller, you know, the rational one, sensible. I didn't want, I, I didn't want to be the voice of noise or idiocy or entertainment, although I did, did some of that, but I really always wanted to be the voice of reason. But, you know, when, once you're touched by death, once you're touched by grief, once you're, uh, and then touched by the power of the resurrection, now, now, now I want to be the voice of hope. Now I want to be the voice of hope. Because you only realize the power of the resurrection once you once the power of the death, once, once the power of death has touched you. And then resurrection becomes real and you can and I want our church to be a voice of hope in a city of idols. But you only get to be a clear voice of hope when you've heard the voice of hope ringing in your heart, that Jesus is risen. Christ is risen, the tomb is empty. Death has been defeated. Death is overcome. And when that happens, that's when our, it, it reorders our entire life, it reorders our relationship, it reorders our desires, and it makes us a community of worshippers with real hope in a city of idols. And that's my prayer for us as a church, that this city of idols will see a community of worshippers and will hear our clear voice of hope, where our entire life is ordered around this one reality that Christ is risen from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we... Uh, call out to you, Lord, from a city full of idols and uh, with hearts, Lord, that are idol manufacturing factories. There are so many things that we are drawn to, to, del to delight in, that we look to as substitutes and have chosen them in your place. And in, in spite of this, Lord, in spite of the, the way that we are, the way that we set our hopes on things that promise far more than they can actually deliver. The way we turn our backs to you, the way we cling to things, Lord, that we consider so precious that if anybody gets near to them, they'll see the worst of us. In spite of how we are, in spite of how we become less human, Lord, you also have chosen a substitute. You also, Lord, have chosen someone who receives judgment in our place and who lives a life of submission to you in our place. He lives the life that we could never have lived and he dies the death that we should have died. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness to us in this, Lord. And we, we, we want to be a people, Lord, who obey you, Lord. We want to be a people who, whose desires are being transformed, they're being changed as we behold you, as we behold your goodness, Lord. And we pray for our relationships, Lord, for our relationships to be restructured, for us to find family in one another, for us to become a people who really love one another.
And Lord, I pray for your spirit to move among us, for your spirit who lives in us, Lord, to uh, bring our mortal bodies to life, as your word says, Lord, because the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead now lives in us. And I pray that our hearts will hear the clear voice of hope, Lord, that Christ is risen, that you will serve us in our grief, that you will serve us uh, in our rebellion, that you will draw us to yourself, Lord, out of your loving kindness. And I pray that our, our heart's testimony of you, Lord, will be that this is the one who rescued me. This is the one who has loved me. And I pray that our heart's desire as a community will be truly to love God, so whatever we do, whatever we want, will be conformed to your pleasure. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.